Hi, everyone. Great to see you all. Isn't it great to be in person? Uh, I want to thank uh, Alec and the whole learners team for inviting us all here together uh, and making it possible for us to talk about something in a really important time. Uh, you know, a lot of us are a little concerned about the job market. We've had real data come back to us telling us that UX research maybe isn't as valued as we thought it was or that we hope it to be. And so today I'm going to talk about how you can enhance your individual value of the discipline. So let's talk about maybe something that would do that. How about discovering a billion dollar unicorn before it becomes a meaningful competitor? How about this? How about Zoom going public in 2019? There's their IPO. And you can see by 2020, 2021, definitely, there was a huge growth in user base, also in paying customers. But well before that, well before the pandemic, well before the IPO, there were five years of weak signals. Zoom was making waves out there. Wouldn't it be nice for us to be able to tell something like that ahead of time? Well, guess what? I did, and I fucked it up. Um, so I'm going to tell you how, how I did that. OK, so this is actually from a real study that I did in 2014. Uh, I was working at Microsoft Office at the time, and my, uh, the study was a uh, study of productivity, and the bleeding edge of productivity. So I went to startups in four of the top 10 locations for startup activity. And this happened to be in San Francisco, uh, just down the road over here, as a matter of fact. And I did an ethnography where I hung up with a bunch of startups. And I noticed this thing happening. There's this meeting, with a virtual meeting. This startup was functioning completely normally on multiple coasts at the same time. There was easy turn taking. The meetings were straightforward. There was no fuss or muss. People were able to get to the meeting very quickly. Uh, multiple uh, form factors. Uh, they were on computers, phones, iPad. They were doing web browse. It was easy for them to get on and easy for them to have a meeting. So of course, uh, I brought this back and I said, "Hey, everybody, there's this thing out there, and it's really important because you know we make Skype, right? And um, this is a Skype killer." And they're like, "What kind of name is Zoom? Like, forget it." So I discovered this unicorn before, long before it went public and well before it became a household name, and yet I wasn't able to make anything of it. Now why? That's what this talk is about. It's about strategic foresight. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what is foresight and how I did not practice it all the way that I should have. Foresight quite simply is thinking about the future, right? Looking for change at the margins. You'd be surprised to learn that most people almost never think five years in the future. The majority of people don't do that. We know that from research from Institute from the Future. Uh, much less do they think about the future around very important areas, not the main stage, not here, but on the edges, right? They don't think about that kind of stuff. Strategic foresight is about using thinking about the future for intentional change, right? You're thinking about the future you want. How do you do that? Well, you scan for changes, especially around the margins, right, where things aren't happening. And you are imagining multiple futures, not just a single future. I'm not talking about prediction, okay? I'm talking about multiple futures. And you plan for the future that you want, but you're ready for the future that you don't want. This is the practice of strategic foresight. It's actually a real thing. There's a discipline about it. So this is basically thinking about the future with purpose, with purpose. But it's not a to-do list. A lot of times when we get called into meetings, they're like, let's talk about future trends. And they're like, hey, what should we do? What cool features should we build? Hey, are flying cars going to be a thing? What about 3D printing? Let's talk about how 3D printing is going to revolutionize everything. And incidentally, in 2014, I am not even joking how often I heard product managers talk to me about 3D printing revolutionizing everything. And 
it, it didn't, and it hasn't. And it, pro it might, it might, but there has to be multiple areas of change. And I'll talk about that in a second. So it is not a product roadmap. If somebody calls you into a product roadmap meeting and says, let's do some strategic foresight, what features should we build? You're gonna go, oh, we're not doing strategic foresight, are we? We're not predicting the future because one cannot predict the future. One can predict areas of likely change, but we cannot make precise predictions. If you wanna talk about it in MBA speak, which I think we should, right? I think we should, because really what we here are, are business advisors. And if we don't accept that role, we may find ourselves in situations where we're not entering into business decision-making, right? But if you accept this role, you're gonna start talking about blue ocean strategy, which is a term you may know. Um, blue oceans are where nobody's working, no competitors are, it's wide open, as opposed to a red ocean, uh, where all the competitors are, and there's a lot of activity. You may think about unique value or unique value propositions, right? Strategy, according to Michael Porter, is about doing things differently with unique value, right? Unique value proposition, that's what strategic foresighting is about. And it's about building that sustainable advantage because you start well in advance of everybody else. And then you personally would be described as somebody who can see around corners or anticipate change. These are important things to be uh, endowed with. It's, it's helpful if people see you in these ways, but it's more important that we embrace this ourselves, right? That we believe we are seeing around corners, that we are anticipating change, that we're thinking about strategy. Strategic foresight is about thinking about the future for a purpose, and this is how you do it. Now, this is, this is a point where everybody brings out their phones and snaps a photo, and that's totally fine. Go ahead, it's fine. Um, this is also on my website, uh, so you can take a look, samladner.com slash and there's a QR code at the very end in case you wanted to get the whole deck, you can get it. But let's talk about this. This deserves a little bit of time. Okay. When we look at the, the, the bottom half, that's the, the part that we talk about when you get called into the meeting and said, let's do some visioning, right? But the top half, that's where we as researchers can be doing work all along the way. All along the way, we are scanning all the time for systematically scanning for chosen sources. We're good at that, right? We're good at knowing what's a valid source and what's not. We're really good at analysis and sorting and tagging and putting into a database. That's the kind of thinking that we tend to have. Uh, I may quibble a little bit with Madeline uh, talking about research scientists only being lab-based. I am a social scientist and I, I don't quibble about that at all. Part of the reason I'm a scientist is because I systematically save and, and document. And then we have multiple data points across multiple domains. And we come up with holistic points of view. And we have position papers. This is what the future is going to look like. And then we create sets of scenarios. Maybe we do this with our stakeholders. OK, right about here is where I did not do strategic foresight. When I discovered Zoom in my ethnographic study in 2014, I did not have a holistic view. I didn't have multiple sources across multiple domains situating the Zoom that, that I, a meeting that I observed, situating it in a context where smaller organizations were growing. We had more and more startups happening around 2014. We had more and more startups making different types of technology purchasing decisions, specifically point solutions as opposed to full stack solutions, which is what Microsoft Office was, a full stack solution. As, and now we have Calendly and Zoom and Trello and these individual point solutions that market themselves as best in class. And the full stack solution was not something that those startup people actually thought were important, right? I did not do that. I did not do that. I did not come up with a holistic point of view. And I did actually work with my colleagues in design and product management on outputs, right? Sets of actions and scenarios. Um, and choosing the strategy, well, sometimes that is something that we get to be part of, and sometimes that's actually at the most senior parts of the company, right? And sometimes we don't want to do that because, you know, as Yoris was telling us earlier, we don't want to predict, right? We're a little worried about precise prediction. And there's two ways you can cope with that. You can double down on Bayesian approaches, right? You can get quote unquote rigorous quantitatively, or 
you can embrace uncertainty. Let's talk about that. Is there anywhere that you can do uh, embracing uncertainty more than in a casino, right? Sure, sure, okay. Let's talk about imperfect information, right? That is what we have on a regular basis. We have imperfect information. And we don't know how much we're supposed to predict. Annie Duke is a PhD dropout and a professional gambler. She wrote a book, I love this book, Thinking in Bets, and she's like, hey, you know what? You business people, you have to make decisions all the time, and your decisions are imperfect. Well, guess what? I do that for a living, and let me tell you how that helps. Unpredictability is normal for gambling. And it's normal for us, except for we're not really thinking about it in these terms, right? Unpredictability is a completely normal thing. How do gamblers cope with that? Annie tells us there's basically three things to keep in mind. Uh, the first one is called resulting. And resulting is pay more attention to the outcome than the process, the result, right? So for example, uh, Ken Burns in his recent commencement address talked about this. He says, don't confuse success with excellence. Don't confuse a winning hand with being a better gambler. You might have just been lucky, right? So she says what you need to do to avoid resulting is keep your process, right? Pay attention to your, and I, we would call this rigor, right? So you did a great study and you, you paid attention to all the things that you had and you were scanning and you contextualized it and you made a holistic understanding and the product managers didn't listen to you. Did you fail? Absolutely not. Don't result. Likewise, if you have a product manager who loves the thing that you did, some VP thought it was great, but you kind of slapped it together and it was kind of garbage. Maybe you shouldn't be paying attention to the results. So this is good advice for us, good advice. Objectivity is something that we think we understand really easily because we tend not to lead our participants. We know how to ask questions well, but it's more than just that kind of objectivity. How thirsty are you? Do you know how thirsty you are? Is it affecting your ability to be objective? Make sure that you're in touch with not just how you're leading your participants, but how you're leading yourselves, right? Get in touch with that. And I confess, I was very thirsty when I did my Zoom study, quite thirsty. I mean, it was a great study. It was amazing and um, got some impact out of it, but not enough. And I should have not resulted. I should have stayed objective as well. And of course, use your feedback, right? Okay, now we get feedback a lot. What kind of feedback am I talking about here? Multiple sources. Uh, the concept of the repeat customer. Is there somebody coming back to you on a regular basis? First of all, that's a good sign. That's a person you should probably double down on. Secondly, why? What is it about this person? What is it about their needs? What is it about their location that makes you valuable to them? And likewise, on the opposite, I have a whole file, um, a keyword, keyword tags, I have two. I have good feedback and I have bad feedback. <laughs> Some of my good feedback are how I've quantitatively tracked, how many people read my reports, for example, how many people joined the Slack channel that I put together, how it changed over time. Qualitative feedback, obviously you get regular stuff for your, your reviews or what have you, but also bad feedback. Things, bad feedback sometimes is inferred by me from what happened, right? And I will write that down and I say, this is what happened, it didn't go well, la 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 la, hashtag bad feedback. So if we embrace foresight and we embrace this approach, we can put these things together. Gambling and foresight will help us bet on the future. And in fact, that's exactly what the founders of scenario planning came up with. This is one of the founders of scenario planning. Back in the 70s, he came up with this and he was trying to predict with precision. Precision was, he was like, there's gotta be more sophisticated quantitative techniques. We've gotta get better at it. We've gotta find all the variables. And he was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if the uncertainty is a feature, <clears throat> not a bug? What if we embrace it and put it into our process? What if we do that? So we can actually make uncertainty part of our reasoning, and we should, because we're never going to be certain. We're gonna do this through scanning, regular scanning. I'm gonna talk about each one of these. We're gonna talk about multiple scenarios, and we're gonna talk about being ready. Each one of these are possible for us without a huge amount of work. First of all, scanning. Steep 
is a method. Uh, sometimes it's called pestle. Yeah, slightly different. Steep is a method. You probably don't want to just focus on the technological. If all you do is a track 3D printing trends, you're not ever going to understand how Zoom took off like crazy in 2020. You're not going to understand that because you haven't kept pace with all of the different areas. Steep is a tool that you can use. It's a, it's a method that you can use to keep track of multiple domains, right? So for example, economic, the economic domain, what's happening in the macroeconomic environment. Uh, we heard that term a lot recently, the macroeconomic environment. Well, if you've been tracking, you know. And also keep track, right? Keep track. The Fed is going to bring down uh, interest rates. We know that's going to happen. Some of us have backgrounds in economics. Some of us don't. You don't have to be an economist. You also don't have to be an environmentalist to understand the environmental impacts of what's happening now. The climate crisis is already here, and we know it's already affecting business. It's affecting life. It's affecting everything. And the political realm, authoritarianism is on the rise. For the first time in about 50 years, there are fewer countries that are democratic than not. So let us pay attention to these things. Use Steep as your framework. And then stick it into your database. This is a real database. I have one on my website that is an uh, empty one and that you guys can take a look at. Again, samlander.com slash foresight. You'll see it. You don't have to write this down. This is a real database, a relational database in Notion. You, you, using Steep as our guideline. And these are all the different kinds of weak signals that we've noticed, right? Around the edges, at the margin. Uh, mental health policy is changing at work. Great. Four-day week, four work week is paying off. More people, more productive, uh, happier overall. Great. These are all weak signals. These are what Tomer Sharon would call the atomic level of insight, right? It's a complete thought, a complete piece of insight. Here's a great one that I picked up working at Workday. Uh, 2020, 70% of American accountants reached retirement age. Okay, guess what? Every year since 2012, accounting majors have declined in number. Yikes. The accounting certification system just, actually, and this isn't even the database because this literally just happened. They just reduced their hours, their practical hours that are required to become a certified uh, public accountant. Yikes. Okay, there's a lot going on. You can see how you can put all these things together and you can keyword them, right? Steep is the global category, and then there's keywords. And then you go into scenarios. Okay, so we don't know what kind of scenarios all the time. The one that we often think of is, we got, we got two basically that we think of. We think about Terminator, and we think about Star Trek, right? Everything's amazing and transformation. These 3D printers have changed my life. I'm so happy now. Um, or these 3D printers went crazy, and they took over the world, right? Those are the two that we tend to think about. But these ones also occur. The slow change. And the regulation situation, GDPR is a good example, right? Europe is probably going to be regulating AI in a way that's quite significant. In fact, the, the White House now is already starting to do that. So these scenarios, you make scenarios based on your weak signals, you mix and match social, technological, et cetera, changes, and you say, what would happen if these things happen? What kind of transformation scenario would we get? What kind of growth scenario would we get? What kind of regulation and control scenario would we get? And you help your stakeholders make sense of these things. I use these specifically when I was testing whether or not we were going to have uh, a problem with AI in the workplace. And the regulation and control scenario, which I gave the participants in a, uh, the respondents in a survey, this is the one that they thought was probably most likely. And there's their expert experts, so that was probably true. We'll see how that goes, right? So you bet on that. Now you're thinking, how am I going to do this? This is going to take so much work and so much time. It doesn't have to take as much time as you think. If you have not been scanning, by the time you get called into the room and say, let's talk about the future, you're kind of out of luck. So you have to scan regularly. Very, very lightly. Very, very lightly. You scan your sources every day. And you use the science of habit to do this. I literally do this still. You put visible reminders in your doc. You put visible reminders on your phone. You make it easy for yourself. Lower the friction, right? And you have to have a basket for your knowledge, right? How many people have, like, their basket is, like, 8,000 tabs? 
I like, I can't even look at that. Like it makes me crazy. I'm like, oh, it's going to crash. You're going to lose everything. You're stressing me out. Have a knowledge basket. Don't make Chrome tab your basket and keywords and tagging. Doesn't have to be hard. Doesn't have to be hard. So these are the real tools that I use. I used to use Instapaper. Now I'm using mostly Pocket. I use Notion. I read on Kim, Kindle and Libby. I use Readwise. All of these things work together. And these are my real keywords that I have developed. Now you can copy these if you want, but I would recommend that you develop your own keywords. So if I'm reading a study, for example, about 70% 70, uh, 70 of accountants reaching retirement age, I know exactly how I'm going to tag it. You should know how you're going to tag it. And over time, you'll see that you'll have a bunch of stuff here, right? Oh, I have a whole thing on the default mode network. That's cool. Uh, how did that happen? I'm not sure. But I'm really interested in the default mode network, I guess. I have climate change. You see how I can mix and match these, right? Mix and match these. So you have to have a basket. If you don't have a basket, all your scanning is going to go out the window. Your scanning is light. Every day, little bits. Your tagging is going to make it so much easier over time. So when you're going to be doing this kind of work, you would have the holistic perspective, which I did not have, which I did not have. What did I miss when I was doing my study, my ethnographic study? I didn't have the full picture and I didn't have my keywords all set up with all of my other changes. So I withstood the conversations about 3D printers and missed the Zoom boat. So to sum up then, you got, so this is a QR code. I don't know if it's going to work from that far away. It might give it a try. If you miss it, it's samladder.com slash foresight. Um, it's good business for you and also for your companies. And you really want to make uncertainty part of how you grapple with things. Don't try to eliminate it. It's never going away. Don't try to eliminate it. Make your good practices. Don't result. Avoid resulting. Good practices. And there's a little micro habit. That's all you got to do. So if you do one thing before you leave today, think about your keyword system, or maybe think about your sources, get your basket in order, and then you're well on the road to making, avoiding the mistake that I made. And that's it. Thanks.